Okay, while Emily slash Annie uh, Heald is uh, getting tuned up, uh, let me take care of some introductions first. Uh, Emily is the Water Program Coordinator for Northland Discovery Center. She's uh, She's been at the center, how long have you been there, Emily? Um, almost four years. Okay, she proudly works with towns, lake associations, and town lake committees on aquatic invasive species issues. Emily, we're glad you're with us, and you're going to teach us all about how to discover dragonflies. All right, and you can see my presentation and mouse and everything? Yes, we're good. Awesome. So thanks for having me. As you said, my name is Emily Heald. I'm the Water Program Coordinator here at the Discovery Center. Before I get too far into the presentation, I just want to tell you briefly a little bit about what we do here at the Discovery Center. Uh, we are a smaller organization, so I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of you hadn't heard of us before. So we're an environmental education center located in the beautiful Manitowish waters in Vilas County. And we're primarily known for the education work that we do. So we do all sorts of programming on subjects ranging from tree ID to bugs, wolves, water, anything nature related, you name it, we do a program on it. And we also have a water program that I run, and that program works with lake management planning, invasive species issues, lake level monitoring, all that good stuff that you've been learning about throughout this conference today. We do have a pretty extensive trail system. It's about 12 miles. We're on a small little uh, bog seepage lake, and we're on over 60 acres of state land. And as a nonprofit, we rely mostly on membership fees, donations, program fees, and a few small grants to keep things running. So. If you're interested in learning more about what we do here, I definitely encourage you to check out our website, simplydiscoverycenter.net. So the topic of the day today is dragonflies. And what I'm gonna do here is go through a little bit of their evolution and history. Then we're gonna go through their life cycles, starting at eggs all the way through adults. And then gonna talk briefly about identification. But first, I always like to start my presentations with uh, a little quiz just to warm up your brains, get you in the dragonfly mood. And I know, you know, we can't interact right now, but uh, just think to yourself what you think the answer might be. So what is the fastest recorded speed for a dragonfly? What do you think? 30, 40, 50, or 60 miles an hour? I'll be the guinea pig and say 40. All right. I'll be the bad guy and tell you you're wrong. So 60 <laughs> miles an hour is the fastest recorded speed for a dragonfly set by the southern uh, giant darner. So these are found in the southern United States. This is the largest species of dragonfly that we have. You can see how big this guy is compared to someone's hand. The next quiz for you is how many species of dragonflies are found in Wisconsin? So I have these little uh, swirlies here to indicate about. And the reason for that is because uh, dragonflies don't know where the state border is. So you can't get an exact uh, number for exactly in the state, but about 85, about 110, 190, or 240. I'll go big and say 240. <laughs> about oh. 110 in Wisconsin. Here, see if you can get this one and see how many species of dragonflies are found in the world. 1,000, 2,000, 1,000, 3,000, 5,000, or 7,000? Oh, no, I'm, no, I'm hesitant. I'll say 1,000. <laughs> it's actually 5,000. So you got zero of those. <laughs> good job. It's all right. We're going to learn you up good here, so you'll know. But this one's a nice one, too. What insects do knights fear the most? It's dragonflies. Isn't that funny? All right. So moving right into it, I'm into words and knowing where words are derived from, I think it can really tell you a lot about a subject. So with dragonflies, you often hear those described as odonates, and that's actually their order. So if you look at the entire taxonomy of dragonflies and how they're arranged with other living things, to start off with, they're in the animal kingdom, just like you and I. But where they start to branch off here is in their phylum. So if you further categorize them more specifically, they're arthropods. So that includes things like insects, spiders, crustaceans, things like that. They're in the insect class. You may have guessed that because they do have six legs, three body parts, just like other insects. And then here's where that word odonate comes in. So that's their order. 
dragonflies and damselflies fall into that category. We're going to talk a little bit about the difference between those two at the very end. But uh, interestingly, with those word der derivations, that word odonata comes from the Greek word odontos, which means tooth. And we're going to talk all about how freaky their mouth parts are a little bit later. And then to distinguish dragonflies and damselflies, they're split into what are called suborders, and dragonflies are anisoptera. So if that's confusing or maybe not even interesting to you guys, don't worry. We're not going to go too far into it. Um, I'm just kind of a word nerd, so I wanted to throw that out there. So dragonflies are an incredibly old species. They actually first appeared in the fossil record about 350 million years ago. All right, so to put that into perspective a little bit, dinosaurs were found in the fossil record about 230 million years ago. So dragonflies are actually 100 million years older than dinosaurs. And how do we know that? Well, we have fossil evidence of uh, dragonflies living during that time. And those dragonflies that were alive millions of years ago, they actually didn't really look a whole lot like the dragonflies that we have here today in terms of size. The, pre the historic dragonflies actually had wingspans of up to three feet. So if you look at a little chart comparing uh, dragonflies from olden days compared to an average sized human, you can see that wingspan it's much wider than that, than that person's body. So it could be kind of uh, creepy seeing that fly over your head in, in those very old times. So my brain personally, I have a hard time imagining what it was like 500 years ago, let alone millions of years ago. So I found this artwork that apparently depicts what the world was like millions of years ago when dragonflies were supersized. Maybe it was a really swampy environment. You have extra large cockroaches, salamanders or lizards, funky alligators flying around. You know, the, the entire world looked different at this point to, to further put it into perspective for you. So if you look at what the continents of the earth looked like, they were still all smushed together. They hadn't even separated yet. So dragonflies, dragonflies have been through a lot here, okay? But we're gonna focus on modern day dragonflies here. And the way I'm going to, um, to organize this talk today is that we're going to go step by step throughout the life cycle. So starting here at, at step one, we have eggs, then we're going to go to the nymph stage, we're going to go through to uh, the adults, and then finally we're going to spend the most time on, on this adult stage because this, you know, this really is what you think of when, when you think of a dragonfly. All right, so we're not gonna spend too much time on eggs, but there are some interesting tidbits. The first one being that there's not just one way to lay an egg. There's actually four main ways that dragonflies can lay their eggs. It just really depends on the species. So if you take a look at the tip, this is a female dragonfly, right? Cause she's laying eggs. The tip of her tail, you see all these eggs coming out here? That's called the ovipositor, okay? So here are the different ways that, that a female can lay her eggs, depending on the species again here. So the first one is called scattering. So in this case, the eggs will come out of the tail of the female and she will scatter her eggs, basically just uh, dropping her eggs, you know, somewhat willy nilly, like down into the water. I always think of this one as the, the salt shaker. This next one's pretty common too. So this is where dragonflies will lay her eggs in sort of a sticky mucousy substance that she'll then entangle around um, plants or maybe some logs or some sort of vegetative matter, matter. Another really common method is for dragonflies to insert their eggs into a plant stem. So for dragonflies that do this, they have a really sharp part on the tip of their tail and they use that to cut a slit into that plant and then they insert their eggs into there. And then finally, some dragonflies will dip their, that ovipositor down into the sediment or down below some leaves and uh, lay their eggs down into the sediment like that. So if you, you know, seeing these and just thinking about, um, you know, all the different, the bad things that can happen as you're a dragonfly egg, some of these do have advantages over the others, you know, inserting it into the stem or down into the sediment, you're obviously a little bit more protected in those cases, whereas just kind of scattering it into the water, much less protected, but species like this still uh, persevere today, so it's not, 
it's not all lost on them. I do have a little video. I hope it works and doesn't lag anyone's uh, computer too much. And none of these really need sound, so we don't have to worry about that. But this is a neat little video of, um, it's slowed down of a dragonfly laying some eggs. And she is actually scattering her eggs because you can see that, that you're not really seeing any sort of sticky substance down in there. So that's what it looks like when a dragonfly is laying eggs. And I did include uh, slides after all my videos of play-by-plays in case there were any problems with playing videos, but I don't think there has been. All right, so after these eggs are laid, hundreds to thousands at a time, they are susceptible to a wide range of predators, especially if you're put you know, directly into the water and not amongst plant material or in the sediment. Those eggs are gonna be a real tasty snack for fish, but another lesser known predator is the water mite, okay? So this is zoomed in on a water mite. I think that these guys as, they're almost like aquatic ticks. So I, I snuck into another presentation. I heard Eric Olson saying that he just found the first tick of the year on his dog, so. If tick season is amongst us and for dragonflies, it's no different. So these guys, they can attach to the adult stage of uh, dragonflies, but they can also attach to dragonfly eggs. You can see that here. So, you know, one or two, not really a big deal, but when you get to tens to hundreds, that can kill eggs, that can kill adults. It's kind of like um, if you've ever heard in wildlife how sometimes like moose and deer can have so many ticks that it's, uh, it really just uh, inhibits them to the point where they can die. So it's kind of like that. So here's a little bit of the process of egg hatching. So this, you know, the dragonfly egg is really the size of just, just tiny, maybe a pinprick. Okay? This is the eye within that egg. And then the process of them hatching, you can see they're so tiny when they hatch out and um, almost you know, transparent, but then they eventually start to look at like what we think of when we think of a dragonfly nymph here, okay? So you can think of the dragonfly nymph, these guys that hatch out from the egg, they're kind of like, they're kind of like, uh, sorry, that keeps happening. They are kind of like uh, dragonfly babies through dragonfly teenage years, okay? It's the stage between the egg and the adult dragonfly. So this ugly, not ugly, it's, it's just different looking. This creature here will eventually turn into our beautiful adult dragonfly. So, you know, that stage, it's not one that we think of often, but um, actually, about 90% of dragonflies' lives are spent underwater in this nymph stage, and it's, it's a pretty interesting stage. So, again, depending on the species, it can last several months, up to several years that these guys are living underwater. And during that time that they're living underwater, they undergo molting. So that's something that insects do where as they grow, they lose that outer shell. That's called the exoskeleton, right? So they grow, they shed their skin, they grow, they shed their skin. And they do that up to 15 times before their final emergence, which we're going to talk about here in a second. And sort of another little interesting nugget that I learned in my research when I'm learning about dragonflies here is that, you know, nymphs, they obviously can move around using all six of their legs, right? They can creepy crawl in the bottom of your leg but they can also move around by using jet propulsion. And the way they do that is by taking water in through the rectum, okay? And the reason they're doing that in the first place is so that they can get oxygen. So they're pulling that water inside them. They are um, sucking the, the oxygen out of that and using it for their own body processes. And then sometimes they just expel that water. But if they wanna get around right quick, they can actually push that water out very quickly and use it as a way to jet propel themselves. So I found this sort of funny animation that depicts that. Unfortunately, couldn't find a video of that for you guys. I think one of the most interesting um, things about these nymphs is that the way that they eat is very, very, um, I don't want to say violent, but it's it's pretty interesting. So nymphs are voracious predators. It's said that they'll eat pretty much anything that moves. So you know, ranging from fish, other aquatic insects, even other nymphs. Okay, 
So one reason that they are really successful predators is because of how their mouth parts are formed. So their mouths are called, this extension of their mouth is called a labium, okay? And that can extend up to a third of the length of their body. So I like numbers and, and again, I like words, but I also like numbers too. And I'm five, six. If my mouth extended a third of the length of my body, that would be 20 inches. So this is a heck of an appendage that's coming out of them, okay? So the way I think of this is more like a, a little arm that can also shovel food into their mouths. And I'm gonna show you a video of that in a second. So as they are uh, predators, they can do this in a few different ways. And again, it depends on the species. Some of them will specialize in these different strategies. Some of them will partake in all of them. So some of these dragonfly nymphs, they'll stalk their prey. So they'll kind of follow them around in the shadows. And then uh, when the time is right, they will pounce. Some of them take a little bit of a lazier approach. Well, they'll sit and wait. They'll, uh, you know, kind of hide behind, a, hide behind a nice aquatic vegetative plant. And then when someone walks by or someone swims by, they'll pounce on them. And then this one I think is pretty cool. This is burrowing. This is more of an ambush style attack the dragonfly nymph will bury itself down into the sediment so that only its eyes are exposed and then you know when something crosses their path it pounces. and i'd also like to point out that um you know nymphs they're they're really interesting but they're also really important to uh everything else that's going on in the lake because they're an important food source so they eat a lot of things, but a lot of other things in the lake also eat them. So fish, birds, other insects, and again, other nymphs. So here's a, a visual representation of some of those diet choices of those nymphs. So here we have a nymph eating a tadpole, a nymph eating a, a little minnow. And then here's that nymph on nymph action that I was telling you guys about. They're just, they don't care who it is. If it moves and it walks past them and they can grab it, they're going to eat it. So I want to show you this video of a dragonfly's mouth and exactly how it works. The title of it is that a dragonfly's mouth will give you nightmares, but it won't actually give you nightmares. It'll make you want to become a scientist. Right. You see that? There's a labium and, and to pause this, you know, again, it's really mostly an appendage. I always think of this as almost an additional arm that's coming out from the dragonfly's mouth here, you know, or this would be like your upper arm, your elbow, and then your forearm and your and your hand. So it's it's basically being used as like a an extra arm to go grab those prey, shove it in their mouth, and then they just tuck it back in all nice like under there. So again, I put those play-by-plays in here in case we had any problems with the video, but these shots are just really nice to show you um, what that process can look like when you're, when you're a dragonfly nymph. All right, so when it comes time for this nymph to uh, emerge as a dragonfly, so the dragonflies we think of today flying on the land, they have to undergo one final molt on land. So what this nymph will do is it'll crawl up out of the water onto the land and it'll usually cling onto plants or docks or you know any surface near the lake that they can grab onto for a little bit. So you, you may have seen this throughout the summer where you'll find all the little shells of the nymphs kind of on your shoreline. It's because they're coming out to emerge as an adult here. And they do this overnight because I mean, look at this guy, that's a vulnerable state to be in. They're on land. They can't run away, they can't fly away yet. We're gonna talk about how those wings come out. They can't do the water jet propulsion thing. They have to sit there completely still while they're doing this. So once they find a good spot, they're gonna emerge uh, with this back bend sort of pattern. So it's gonna be head first into that back bend. They wait a little bit while those legs harden up and then their wings will unfurl. So this, these are the wings right here now. You can see they look almost like a little backpack. He's going to school, okay? But these are actually his wings all wrapped up here. And what the, the dragonfly will do is pump liquid into them so that they unfurl. And then the dragonfly will draw that liquid back into itself 
once it's fully expanded. And like I said, this, this is a real soft bodied organism right here and they're not moving. They are very, very vulnerable in this, in this stage. And so they do have about a 90% mortality rate while they're emerging because they don't have any defenses. And I know, you know, it sounds sad to be vulnerable in that state and for 90% of their, their numbers to die off, but they actually, you know, being eaten in those mass quantities means that they are serving as a very important food source for other organisms. And uh, the whole process, 45 minutes to an hour and, and they'll be out. So again, if you've seen a time um, where dragonflies are emerging in big numbers, and you've probably seen a time where you're seeing a lot of animals eating dragonflies. So I just chose some pretty ones here for you today. You know, these could be chipmunks or other insects eating these guys, different birds and bats, but you know, why not look at some pretty birds here, get excited about spring migration. All right, and I do have a video. I like to use videos because you can only describe things so much, right? So here's a video of dragonflies emerging. This is originally uh, narrated by David Attenborough, if you wanna go look it up and watch the whole video on your own. But here you can see uh, the dragonfly is emerging. It's going doing that characteristic, you know, back bend motion. And this is again, also sped up. So this is not real time. yelling hello to the world and then this is what i was talking about with pumping the wings full of that liquid you see that how they're unfurling there and eventually they'll fill up so much they just pop right open look at that that's got to feel like the best stretch in the world okay so that play-by-play -play. again, we don't need that. So if you've ever wondered, I don't know if you've ever wondered this to yourself, you know, how, how would I know if a dragonfly is freshly emerged or not? Well, this is a dragonfly picture that I took on my front door last spring. And you see how shiny the wings look and how the eyes almost look kind of dull, you know, and the whole body just looks sort of soft. I don't know if that's apparent unless you've looked at a lot of dragonflies but see how shiny those wings are compared to you know one like this that has more dry looking tattered wings see how shiny the eye is that's kind of how you know in the spring um if someone is is real freshly emerged or not so it's just sort of a interesting tidbit there on on how to know what you're looking at with dragonflies this so this is going to be the star of our show today. This is the adult no. dragonfly here. This is where we're going to be spending most oh, of the time. So I like to look at this guy. I think he looks like he's smiling. All right. So he's like, thanks for having me here today, guys. I'm, I'm really excited to talk about my life cycle. All right. So before we get too into all the interesting facts about the adult dragonflies, we got to do a little anatomy lesson here. So stay with me. All right. Like all insects, dragonflies are made up of three main body parts, okay? You got your head, you got your thorax, that fleshy middle part of the body, and then you got your abdomen. So the abdomen of the dragonfly is this whole portion here. So the abdomen has 10 or yeah, 10 abdominal segments, okay, right? So you have one, two, three, four, all the way down to 10. And these are very, very bendy. I almost think of them as being held together like vertebrae almost, so they can go up and down. And they're very bendy. Okay, so the reproductive organs are also on the uh, abdomen here. They're on the male, they're down here, but also up closer to the thorax. We're gonna talk about that in great detail. And this thorax here, this is really the muscular powerhouse of the dragonfly. It controls the head, the wings, and the legs. So we have four wings, right? Two in front, two in back. And then we have six legs here, just like all insects, right? And their heads are pretty rounded, right? So this is a fairly standard insect head with the exception of, do you see this little indent in the back here, that little depression? That actually is, is 
intentional in the world of evolution, I suppose. It, it gives them the ability to swivel their head around <clears throat> and it gives them more mobility. We're gonna talk about why that's really important with their eyesight. They have these two little antennas up here. Those help them to assess wind speed and direction that helps them in flight. And this, this, these heads, you know, you see a dragonfly and they have these tiny little heads, but they're very, very complex. And it's very important because dragonflies cannot, they cannot smell, they cannot hear, and they cannot vocalize, okay? So what, what sense does that leave you? Sight, okay? So dragonflies are very, very dependent on their sight and they have good sight. So they have, you know, if you look at a dragonfly head right here, these two huge eyes, right? One, two, that wrap around their head, plus combine those two huge wrapping eyes with the, that little divot in their head. They have that head on a swivel. They can see pretty much in 360 degrees, okay? If you zoom in on one of these eyes, it would look something like this little honeycomb pattern. Each one of these little honeycombs is a lens, and they have about 30,000 lenses per eye, and that lets them see an ultraviolet and polarized light, okay? So this is something that, you know, when you think about the natural world, it really blows my mind because dragonflies are seeing the world totally different than from what you and I see it. This is apparently what the world looks like if you can see with UV uh, vision, okay? So those lenses, they also help them, they're able to discern individual wing beats of their prey. So they can look at a prey, see those individual wing beats and determine how fast that prey is going, what direction it might be heading, and that helps them as a predator. And we're gonna talk about that more. And um, you know, so again, they don't have those other senses and so they're entirely dependent on eyesight. If you, show, if you show a UV light onto the body of a dragonfly, they actually have some patterning on their bodies that's only visible under a UV light. And that's sort of a, a communication method if they can flash those, their bodies in different ways. All right. So zooming back out to take the full view of the dragonfly. Let's look at now the appendages of a dragonfly. So look here, look at all these little details on the legs of a dragonfly, all those little hairs, you see those? So, you know, depending on the species, these can be more or less pronounced. I, I chose this picture because he's got real hairy legs, right? These little hairs are used during feeding time to basically be little uh, baskets that they can use to grab their food. So when this dragonfly here sees another insect that it wants to have for a little snack, it will come up on that prey, put all of its legs in front of itself, and then use those legs and those little hairs to shove that prey item swiftly back into its mouth. So you bet that I have a video on that. It's a short one, but it's awesome. This is the prey up there, see it? Coming up, boom. So you see that how it, it's basically using those, uh, this is where these play-by-plays will come in handy here. It's, you can't see it in the video so much, but all these little hairs, those help by making this little cage around the prey item so that it, it's really difficult for that prey to escape. And so then it's more easy for you to um, shove it into your little dragonfly mouth and have that for dinner. Okay, so something you're going to be noticing in these videos and especially in these play-by-plays are these wings. Okay, so remember we've talked about the wings as being the, or as the thorax as being the muscly powerhouse of the dragonfly. Remember that from the anatomy lesson? So for most insects, for insects other than dragonflies, their wings will attach to the exoskeleton, which is this outer shell, right? And then the exoskeleton attaches to muscles within the thorax. But if you are a dragonfly, you have an advantage because dragonfly wings are attached directly to the muscles within the thorax, okay? And that may not sound like a big deal, but it actually makes these muscles quite a bit more powerful. So they can get much more powerful wing beats with that. 
each of these wings can move individually. And we saw that in the last video. So that gives them really superior, superior control over their movements. They can fly forwards, they can fly backwards, they can fly to the left, they can fly to the right, they can hover, they can you know, do loop-de-loops, they can fly in the wind, they can do all sorts of things, okay? So they're excellent flyers and that again helps them with predation. So if you look more closely at their wings, okay, you notice they have all these really pretty venation structures here, right? So these thin ones here, those are mostly used for support within the wing. You know, think of it like, like lattice structuring within a house, right? But what I really want to draw your attention toward is what's called the pterostigma. So let's break that down again. Pterostigma literally means wing mark, all right? So all these marks, these dark bands on a wing. Each wing has them on all the dragonflies. So see here, one pterostigma, two pterostigma, three pterostigma, four pterostigma. And these things are significant. So what they're actually doing is that those pterostigmas are slightly heavier than the rest of the wing. And that is really gonna be helping them with those aerodynamics to glide, fly faster, and being able to control all their movement, okay? So the aerodynamics of dragon, dragonflies, they're super complex, they're really intense, they're very useful, and they're so awesome that researchers from, you know, airplane companies, people that want to be flying man-made items, they're studying dragonflies to learn from them and to help, help us use these, these man-made objects to function better. So this is another great example of how much you can learn from nature. So dragonflies, they're teaching us, okay? All right, I have a video of those wing muscles. Just to show you a little bit, it's wing muscles in slow motion. And you can kind of get an image once they really start pumping here, they'll get going a little bit faster. This is in slow motion again, right? But you can just really see that thing churning uh, and really being able to power those wings, okay? And then this video also points out that there's a, a breathing hole by their wings as well. So that's awesome. That's just awesome. All right, so moving away from anatomy a little bit, let's zoom out. Let's talk about where dragonflies live. Well, you guys probably have a pretty good idea that they like the wet environments, right? So when we talk about dragonfly habitat, what we're talking about here is uh, where they live during the nymph stage underwater and where they breathe. So dragonflies, they can fly pretty much wherever they want, but when we're talking habitat, we wanna know where they're living as nymphs and where they're breeding. So um, it really, it just depends on the species. So some species, they like really oxygenated, pristine water, you know, think of like a trout stream. Some of them like boggy swampy areas, like marshes with mucky bottoms. So those are good for meadow hawks. If you've ever seen those smaller red dragonflies, I see those all the time around uh, like retention ponds, around grocery stores, like places where sometimes I'm surprised that life is thriving. Sometimes dragonflies uh, like those more boggy swampy areas. Some like the structure around a lake, like really heavy uh, plant structure and wooded structure. They like that for predatory avoidance. What all dragonflies have in common is that they all prefer a natural shoreline. So if you're someone who really likes a lawn and you have a lawn all the way from house to waterline, it's not really conducive to dragonflies. It's also not really conducive to overall lake health, but we're going to focus on the dragonfly component today. So there have actually been studies done that have shown that uh, dragonfly numbers, reproduction, species diversity, all those things are improved with natural shorelines. So if you like dragonflies, get yourself a native garden in your yard, look into the Healthy Lakes program, you know, disperse some seeds, plant some plugs, and uh, if you plant it, the dragonflies will come. So what are those dragonflies eating in those habitats? Well, the answer is live insects, and they're known as opportunistic feeders. So what that means is that they're gonna eat whatever is available when they can get it. So they eat things like mosquitoes, 
flies, beetles, ants, and then, you know, just like the nymph stage, they'll even eat other dragonflies, they'll eat butterflies. Um, this is actually a picture of a dragonfly having a tasty snack of a caddisfly on my shoulder a couple summers ago. So I thought that was pretty cool. I had lunch with the little guy a couple years ago. So remember we talked about those complex wing skills uh, and the, the ability to see very, very well. Those two things combined makes the dragonfly one of the most successful predators out there. They have an 80 to 95% predation success rate. What does that mean? It means what are the chances if when this dragonfly sees, say, a mosquito, what are the chances that that dragonfly is actually going to be able to capture that mosquito and eat it? Well, 80 to 95 times out of 100, that dragonfly is going to be successful to have a little snack. So to put this into perspective about how big of a deal this 80 to 95 percent is, wolves, their predation success rate, about 15 percent. Lions, 17 to 30. This is a really big range depending on the source you look at. At peregrine falcons, they're considered hot shots at that 47 percent. None of that compares to the dragonflies, 80 to 95 percent. So just really awesome predators here. And so moving around, doing all that complex wing motion takes a lot of energy. So dragons are actually going to be eating 10 to 15 percent of their body weight every day. So again, I'm into the numbers. If you weigh 150 pounds and you're eating 10 to 15 pounds of food a day, that's a lot of food. So it takes a lot to keep up with the energy of a dragonfly here. All right. So now we're going to move on to dragonfly reproduction and how they reproduce. So we're going to revisit anatomy here real quick. So let's take a look. We're going to be looking at a male dragonfly. So remember we have our 10 abdominal segments, okay? And at the end we have claspers. I'm going to talk about that in a second. So something to know here for males, their testes, those are located here on segment number nine, but the portion that the female actually comes in contact with is located up here on segments two and three. So that's where we have what's called the hamulus. And again, this male will need to transfer, remember they're really bendy, transfer his sperm up here to the hamulus. And the hamulus is what the female comes in contact with. So zooming in on that, the secondary genitalia as it's known, this thing is, is kind of crazy. It has the ability to defertilize a female from a past encounter, okay? So if a male goes to mate with a female, and she's already, you know, full from another male, he can use this hamulus to scoop out that male's deposit and replace it with his own. So that's his little sneaky way of ensuring that he's passing on his genetics. So again, remember females, they have an ovipositor at the end. That's where her reproductive organs are. So let's walk through this reproduction step by step, okay? So in this picture, our male was orange on top. Our female is yellow here. So step numero uno is that the male is going to use those claspers on the end of his tail. He's going to use that and grab the female by the back of the head. You can see that here. In this clasping system, this is a lock and key system. So the claspers of a male of one species will only fit into the back of the head of the same species. So that's to prevent interspecies breeding, right? Okay, then our female is going to arch her abdomen, remember her ovipositor, that needs to come into contact with the hamulus, okay? This position that the dragonflies are in now, this is known as the wheel, okay? So that, that's a pretty common uh, position to see dragonflies in. I see them like this all summer long when I'm paddling along rivers where these dragonflies are connected. I used to think that uh, they're fighting, but most of the time they're not, they're having a great time. So depending on the species, some will fly into the trees, some mate midair, it really just depends. And again, depending on the species, 15 minutes to over an hour, that activity can last. And once they're done, the male doesn't always let go. Sometimes he'll do what's called guarding to ensure that another male doesn't come along and use his hamulus to remate with the female. So they can do this in a couple different ways. One's called contact guarding. In this case, the male will stay attached to the female until she's done laying her eggs. So he's still holding on to her. 
she's dipping in and laying her eggs there. A male can also hover guard. So in this case, he'll let go of the female, but he'll hover around her and fly all over um, around her head and just be kind of annoying to ward off other males. And I like this one because of the name karate guarding. In this case, some species of males will, they'll use their claspers and grab another male by the back of the head to sort of aggressively ward off those males until the female lays her eggs. All right, so we're all made it up. I just want to tell you a couple more interesting tidbits about dragonflies here. So temperature control. So like all insects, dragonflies are cold-blooded. That means that the temperature inside of them matches the temperature outside. So compare that to you and I. We sweat, we shiver. I'm wearing a hoodie right now. We're doing these things to, to maintain our internal body temperature around 98 degrees, right? Dragonflies are at the whim of the weather and the season. So if it's cold out, their body temperature gets cold. If it's hot, their body temperature gets hot. But when it's very hot, that can be deadly to a dragonfly. So they have to have different ways to cool off. And some one of those ways is by going into what's called an obelisk position. So this dragonfly here is in the obelisk position. This is pretty common to see too if you watch dragonflies for a while. So what this dragonfly is doing is actually uh, decreasing the surface area that it is the sun is exposed to. So what I mean by that is if you see a dragonfly just chilling like this all flat like, that's a lot of surface area for these sun rays to be coming down and hitting that dragonfly. Whereas if you stick your abdomen up in the air, imagine those sun rays coming down, a lot less area to be, to be hit with there, okay? If they wanna warm up, if dragonflies get a little chilly, a couple of, a couple of things they can do there. Wing whirring, basically just, you know, think about if you're cold and you kind of start pumping your arms a little bit to warm yourself up. Dragonflies can do that too. Or they can bask, which is this sunbathing like this guy's doing right here. So they can just hang out and lay in the sun for a little bit. So here's a, a, a couple pictures comparing the dragonfly in the obelisk position, very grand, to an actual obelisk. So like a pointy tower structure. This is what an obelisk actually is. Another interesting feature that dragonflies can do with temperature control, so this one's common with darners, is changing color. So as it gets colder, some of them can become darker. It's like putting on a black t-shirt in the sun versus a white t-shirt, right? So if you're wearing a black t-shirt, you feel a lot warmer compared to if you're wearing the white t-shirt. So these guys, they're just changing their t-shirt. So take a look here on the left. So this is a time series as we go down, okay? So we're starting here, dragonfly looking pretty dark in the abdomen here, right? Over time, getting lighter, lighter, lighter. What's this guy doing over here? So he's putting on the black t-shirt and going to the white t-shirt. He's probably feeling a little hot, right? He's getting into that lighter color, okay? And then compare that over here going down lighter, a little darker, darker, darker. This dragonfly was a little chilly. We're putting on the darker colored t-shirt there. All right. Where do dragonflies go in the winter? Reflect in your mind on December and January and assuming you stay in Wisconsin, right? Think about how many dragonflies, all the different species of dragonflies that you see in December and January. Is that, is that accurate? No, you did not see dragonflies in December and January. They don't put on their little mittens like we do. Dragonflies, the adults will die or they have to migrate to, to warmer areas, okay? Nymphs, on the other hand, don't forget our little nymphs here, they can overwinter under the water. They just bury themselves under some leaves and just hunker down for the winter. But these adults, they die or they migrate, okay? So let's talk about migration a little bit here. Again, this is really gonna depend on the species, but the common green darnart, this is a good example. So these guys will migrate from up north down to Mexico and Texas, they'll lay their eggs down there, and then those eggs, once they emerge from nymphhood, they emerge and they fly north in the spring. And these are actually some of the first dragonflies that we see here in the spring. They lay eggs before some species even emerge, and then those emergence are the juveniles that will then leave that fall. Okay, hopefully that makes sense there. Another really interesting example of dragonfly migration is the wandering glider. 
okay? The wandering glider in Wisconsin, standard, I don't wanna say boring, but I'll say standard, they just go south. But if you are a wandering glider that lives in Africa or India, these guys are migrating across the entire Indian Ocean. So this is Africa here, right? This is India. And these guys are migrating across the entire Indian Ocean to get where they're going. So this migration is twice as far as mon monarch butterflies will migrate. And they have modified body parts to do this. So if you look at their back wings, I hope you guys can see this, but you see how when you come down on the top of the wing and then it goes straight back like this, that's unique. That's a really wide back wing for a dragonfly. A lot of them kind of more scoop up like this, right? So they have these really wide back wings and it helps them to be able to glide better and expend less energy. They can just catch up on a, an air current over here and glide on their way. So you're probably wondering to yourself, well, why do they, why do they go that far? Well, what they're doing is following rainy seasons. So in India, when it starts to dry off, they head over to Africa where the rainy season's just picking off. So they'll mate and lay their eggs and do their dragonfly thing. When it starts to dry out in Africa, you just head right back on over to India. It's kind of like some of you guys where you go from Florida to Wisconsin and uh, you know, you just live a nice well-traveled life. Okay. We've talked about a lot of different dragonflies here. Spiders, donners, darners, uh, meadow hawks. How do you know the difference between them all? Well, I have some bad news for you. It takes a lot of practice. So you can net specimens, you can look at them with a good field guide. I'm gonna recommend a couple to you guys at the end. Just know that when you're getting into this, that females and mature adults tend to look different and juveniles can sometimes look different. So even though there is about 164, you know, 115 species of dragonflies, there are twice that many in looks in Wisconsin, if that makes sense, because one species can look uh, quite different from within the same species, they can look different. I found this neat little app to help get you started. If you have a smartphone, this app is really neat. It's just called Dragonfly ID. And the way this works is that you can search by size, uh, by where you found it, and what I think is the most helpful is by color. So remember we talked about those retention ponds that I was seeing by the grocery store? Well, I was seeing all these red dragonflies flying around there. I was like, what the heck is that? So I opened up my handy app here. I told it, you know, I selected that I was seeing a red dragonfly. And what this app will do is pops up all of these different possibilities. You can click on all of them. It'll show you um, a close up of those dragonflies. It'll, it'll uh, if you let it, it will geolocate to the area that you're in so you can see if these have been reported in the same time frame of where you are or if it's not the right time to be seeing that dragonfly. You can see all across the nation where those dragonflies are spotted. This looks almost like a migration line or something to me. That's kind of interesting. Um, but, you know, it's, it's hard to get an exact answer using this app, but it can really help you narrow it down, okay? All right, and then I'm gonna go through this real quick. I think a lot of people know this, but I'm gonna cover it anyway. What is the difference between a dragonfly and a damselfly? Well, let's first look at their eyes, okay? This is our dragonfly that we were talking about. See how their eyes are so close, they're, they're touching, okay? Damselflies, on the other hand, their eyes are really uh, far apart. Look how cute this guy is. Oh, that's funny. So, so damselfly eyes will be much further apart, okay? Another distinguishing characteristic that works most of the time is observing how dainty versus robust the body type is. So this is a dragonfly. See how much uh, more robust that body is compared to a damselfly? Dainty, right? You can also look at their back wings. So um, the dragonfly will have a more robust back wing compared to the front. They won't be exactly identical. They'll look similar, but not identical. Damselflies, their wings will look pretty much identical. This is hard to see unless you have a, a dead specimen in front of you. The best way to tell the difference between a damselfly and a dragonfly, and the easiest, is by looking at their wing position at rest. So damselflies, their wings, when they're chilling on a plant or a stick, damselfly wings will always be held together like this, okay? 
dragonflies always spread apart. So that's very easy and that's a good good way of telling them apart. Okay. So you know, I'm not a dragonfly expert by any means. I developed this program to give at local libraries because I was interested in dragonflies and I knew other people were too. So I'm going to do my best. I'm super happy to answer questions you have, but I want to let you know if you're interested in learning even more about dragonflies, this is what I recommend for you, okay? I'm going to first recommend to you the Wisconsin Dragonfly Society. Amazing website. You can pay to be a member, go to their meetings, go to their field trips. But what's really cool about this group is the Facebook account that they have. People post in here all the time, amazing photography. And what they're doing is, um, you know, showing off photography, but they're also getting advice on identification. So people post pictures in that Facebook all the time saying, this is what I saw. What do you think it is? And then all these people that really are into dragonfly identification, they'll identify it for you right away. It's really neat. There's also a cool website called Odes for Beginners. That's a good one too. And then if you're gonna get a field book, I would recommend one of these three. The first one, especially if you're um, you know, living in the Northern part of the state or really any, any of Wisconsin, this should be pretty useful. Dragonflies of the Northwoods by Kurt Mead. Phenomenal guide. This is, this is the guide of all guides for dragonflies, I think. And then there's one for damselflies. Bob Dubois wrote that one. This is another real good one. And then one that's a little bit more general is uh, a nice one that's called Dragonflies by Cynthia Berger. That's a really nice one as well. So with that, I can uh, take any questions that you guys might have. Emily, that was great. Um, I know I want to be for Halloween now. I'm going to start <laughs> working on my costume. Are you going to be a nymph or an adult? Uh, I think the adult's scarier. Oh, the okay. appendage of the nymph looks really cool, but mm -hmm. uh, we'll uh, we'll try the adult first. Okay. All right. So um, somehow I lost. Oh, here we go. I want to get back to the chats chat section and see what we have for questions. So let's see, uh, one question we have in the chat is what aquatic plants can we put in to provide for dragonflies? That's a really good question. So it's really, you know, again, the type of cover that a dragonfly prefers is really gonna depend on the species of dragonfly. But it, it really just falls in line with all of those, those healthy lakes practices that you've probably heard pretty often now, but just in terms of providing a wide variety of plants, and you know that doesn't just mean a lot of different types of flowers it means it means having trees it means having you know mid-layer bushy sort of canopy it means having the ground cover it means having um you know the pretty flowers that you like and then also it, they like having uh emergent uh, emergence vegetation you know so things like pickerel weed or um, you know the different reeds that are kind of sort of aquatic and also sticking out a little bit. Dragonflies like those things too. Great. Uh, next one is: Do the dragonflies emerge on a seasonal schedule? So this one, it kind of depends on the species. A lot of times, dragonflies within the same species will all emerge around a similar time. Okay, but that's not to say that all dragonflies will emerge in early spring. They can emerge throughout, you know, the entire season, early spring, ranging through to mid to late summer. I'll sometimes see dragonflies coming out. I think that, is that answering the question, do you think? I think so. I, I wondered if it's certain species come out in May versus August versus September, or is there a Yeah, yep, pro certain progression? species. Yeah, certain species will emerge at different times. And that book I recommended about dragonflies, it's neat because it, it outlines a lot of those schedules. Good, okay. Let's see, do the adults have the same mouth parts as the nymphs? With the labium, yeah, no, I should have mentioned that. They, they lose that labium after they undergo that final transformation. The mouth looks, um, it still looks kind of freaky if you look at it real close, but they don't, they don't have it, that appendage, that extra appendage there. 
So they're, they're using those legs more. We talked about the leg hairs. They use those to shove food into their mouths. Okay, we've got lots of um, excellent presentation. Fabulous. Thanks, Emily. Happy retirement, Bob. This was fabulous. That was so interesting. Awesome presentation. Very nicely done. Um, let's see. I observed many dragonflies communal egg laying. What's the strategy for that? Oh, like a bunch of dragonflies all laying eggs at the same time. That's what I'm getting. This is a Jim Jim Kloss. Okay. Um, I you know my my best guess for that would be just that that's the life history of those dragonflies, and that's the time of year that they are laying their eggs. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. What an amazing presenter. Love her sense of humor. Really enjoyed your presentation. Enjoyed it very much. What kind of dragonflies would you see in a backyard pond? So that's a, it's a tough one to answer because it's really going to depend on a lot of factors around your pond. You know, is there moving rotter in your pond? Is it more stagnant? What kind of cover do you have around it? If it's a really small pond um, without any sort of inlet or anything and you have good cover around it, then um, I would expect to see more of those boggier species. So remember those meadow hawks, like I was talking about with those retention ponds? I see those in my backyard pond quite a bit too. But you know, just cause you don't have a, a dragonfly like breeding and spending its nymph stage in your pond. If you live close to other bodies of water too, then, then a lot of different species are gonna come and go. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see what else I learned a lot cool information uh, Jim Klaus said we we answered his question correctly so that's good good um, somebody had trouble opening the link I had a hard time with that too yeah yeah I did too at first um, somebody said they would love the PowerPoint slides and will they be available so my understanding is as these presentations are all recorded, but I don't know about the actual files of the slides. I don't either. That, that I can check into. Yeah, but my, uh, my email address, and I can put it in the chat box here, keeping in mind that my name is Emily, not Annie. I don't know why I morphed into that, <laughs> my coworker. But my email is super easy. It's just water at discoverycenter.net. So if anyone wanted pictures or thinks of questions later or wants YouTube links or anything like that, I'd be real happy to share things with them. And Sarah Winju uh, just uh, um, said, yes, they will be. And then Maud put the link on where you'll be able to find the PowerPoint presentation. So that information's in the chat box. So I encourage anybody that would like Emily's slides to check that out. Um, and every session will be on the archive soon. So everybody will be able to check into that and get the slides. Awesome. Um, I've had an opportunity to kind of watch dragonflies in a small clearing. Um, and one of the things that I'm amazed at is how mechanical they are. Mm -hmm. uh, the larger ones just tend to hover at a certain height above the ground and just go back and forth and back and forth. And when they see something moving, they're on it like right now. Yes. It's very efficient, very mechanical, just a ruthless predator. Yes. Really fun to watch. Yeah, they're awesome. And, you know, go to YouTube and just punch in, you know, how did dragonflies work or anything like that. You get all these videos about the, all the adaptations that are going on inside the brain of a dragonfly, all those complex aerodynamics. It, it's, it can be pretty scientific, but, you know, the bottom line is that they are awesome predators. So. Sit outside yep. and watch the dragonflies for a little bit. Hey, Emily, thanks again for your time today. Thanks for presenting at the Wisconsin Lakes and Rivers uh, Convention. I appreciate everybody's attendance. We had over 105 people attending your session today. So thanks so much and hope everybody enjoyed it. And uh, I think that wraps it up for today, if I'm not mistaken. Um, there'll be a survey that will be coming out looking for some feedback 
Hope you had a uh, wonderful convention. I think this worked out really, really well. Have a wonderful spring and summer, and please stay safe. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Emily. Thank you.